we go. All right, welcome everyone. You can see that number start to tick up there. Hello everybody, happy Friday, welcome. <laughs> we'll give people um, a couple minutes here, or a couple, couple seconds, I guess, before we dive in. Um, we're glad you could all join us today. Uh, if you haven't yet attended one of these Hendry virtual tastings, welcome. We think you're in for a treat. We've been having fun, I think, um, drinking some good wine along the way. So we're excited today to talk about climate and to be drinking the barrel fermented Chardonnay and the Pinot Noir. Um, hope you have something tasty in a glass in front of you. Uh, just a couple quick reminders. Uh, again, we know many, many of you are becoming um, you know, very familiar with the system, but if it's the first time you've done this with us, uh, we have set this up as a webinar rather than a meeting. So you can see and hear us. Hopefully we sound okay with our new fancy microphone, um, but we can't see you. So you can stay in your sweats, that's totally fine. Um, but uh, if you wanna participate, we've got a chat going. Angela Douglas, the great, the one and only, is over here uh, moderating the chat. Uh, so if you would like to chat with everybody, there is an opportunity, if you click on the chat, down at the bottom you can see um, uh, uh, an option where you can change who you are chatting with or, or to. Um, so if you want it to just come to Angela, uh, to, the, or to the panelists, um, you can keep it as all panelists. If you want it to be to everybody, if you want to say hi, see who else is in here, um, be sure to change that to panelists and attendees. Uh, also at the bottom of the screen there is um, a Q&A box. So click on there if you have a question for us. We do have time at the end for questions and we hope you'll send them our way. Um, so Angela will be moderating those as well and, and passing them on to us. So um, I think that's sort of the, the technology housekeeping we have for today. So um, without further ado, I guess I guess we should introduce ourselves. If, yeah. if, if this is the first time for folks, I'm Megan Carter. And I'm Mike Hendry. And um, as Megan mentioned, we're, we're talking about climate today and, and really more specifically I think the root of this discussion comes from the fact that we grow 12 different kinds of grapes here. And, and for many people, there are strong opinions about warm regions and cold regions and, and what should grow in each. And I, I think there's sort of this idea that, you know, when it comes to warm grapes and cool grapes, never the twain shall meet, sort right. of. Um, and, and we, I, we hear this a lot in the tasting room. You know, people say, oh, you have, you have Cab and you're growing it next to Chardonnay. And, and how does that work? You know, people have kind of their clearly defined buckets. Yeah. And, and one of the interesting things for me over the years, I, kn I know we've been, you know, we've been told we're too cold for Cabernet, but too warm for Pinot and too cold for Zinfandel, but too warm for Albarino. And I mean, there is, there is, I think, some truth to the fact that you don't really know how this is going to work until you try to grow these things and make wine from them. But um, there are also these very strong opinions that I think don't often line up with what the actual numbers are. Um, so it is a more complicated topic and it's, it's one that sort of lends itself more to, to charts and graphs. And, and we have a few of those, but it, it'll be a minimum. Um, but I, I sort of, I try to distill the points that I would like to convey down to these three things. Um, the first is don't believe everything you hear in the wine business. And I'm, I'm sure this is not a surprise to anybody listening. Um, the other point is that perceptions of warm and cold don't always agree with, with the actual numbers. Um, and the third point is that it, it's really not that strange to be growing uh, Pinot Noir and Cabernet close together. And by the end of this, you'll know why that's the case. Uh, so um, yeah, we're excited to sort of shed a little more light on, on how we do and, and why we can do all the, the different um, things we do here on the Henry Ranch. Um, and I think, again, as, as Mike said, it's, it's a really complex topic. Um, and so uh, do, as I said, send us many questions if you like. Um, but we really hope that, you know, at the end of it, you understand and, and we've hopefully illustrated that you know it is it's there's a lot of gray area here and, and climate is important along with a lot of other factors so um, I think we'll, we'll jump right in right so and I want to start with one point um, I, I found myself on the Sonoma County.com website and I was reading about the Russian River Valley um, and we all know that the, the Russian River Valley is a great place to grow Chardonnay and Pinot um, and to hear them talking about the Russian River Valley, they say this is the appellation that set the standard for California and perhaps New World Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And, and you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily argue with that. There are a lot of great Pinots and Chardonnays that come from that area. Um, 
a couple of lines down, they say, this is where the top wineries in Napa go to get their cool climate grapes, which, which I do have a little more of an issue with. So the, the, the Russian River, it's a big AVA. Um, and very quickly, I mean, all I did was go to Google and say, what's the average temperature in Windsor, which is more or less in the middle of, of the Russian River Valley. Uh, and I did the same thing for Napa, and then I plotted the numbers, and I think we can we can show you that here. Yes. So um, we're going to attempt to share our screen here with you all, um, and uh, we uh, hope this goes as well as uh, it did in our trial. <laughs> so <laughs> we're getting fancy. Um, so hopefully you can see here um, this this chart that Mike created about Napa and, and Windsor temperatures. Yeah, so here we are in, in Windsor in the middle of the Russian River Valley and we're looking at Napa and honestly those two temperature profiles are, are nearly identical. It, it shows Windsor being a slightly warmer uh, in the summer and maybe Napa being, uh, so Windsor having slightly higher highs and, and Napa maybe having slightly higher lows, but they're, they're very, very similar temperature curves. Um, so we can kind switch of, kind back. Of interesting and, yeah. there, yeah. So I mean, and and there are a lot of examples like this. You you'll you'll hear a phrase, and if you do a little research, you you find that it doesn't always, you know, that the numbers don't match up with the language. And um, something important to remember about Napa is that really Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon grew up together here, and everyone now is aware of this judgment of Paris tasting that was really. Cabernet and Chardonnay side by side and all from Napa and and there was um, within that also um, through the 80s what, it, what I was going to say Chardonnay was really the biggest grape here it was what people were planting the most of uh, and for a period of time in the mid 80s Chardonnay was worth almost twice what Cabernet was so uh, Chardonnay was kind of the thing in the early 90s it was the most widely planted grape and these are really some of the formative years for Napa as a, as a quality growing region. So in the last couple of decades, it's certainly been more about Cabernet, um, but it, it hasn't been that way sort of permanently. So I think a lot of you that are at least somewhat familiar with Napa are now saying, yes, you can talk about Napa, but the question is where within Napa are you talking about? And there's um, another thing people love to talk about right, is, you know, what this, the southern end of the valley is like versus the north, so we want to dive into that. Yeah, and, and the perception, I think, with most people is that the southern end of the valley is quite cold, and it's closer to the bay and the fog, and that makes sense, and then as you move north or further north, it gets warmer and warmer, and, and what I want to do is, is, again, look at some real numbers, uh, and by now, you'll, you'll probably have a sense of where I'm going with this. Um, <laughs> But the, the tool that people use, there's really no perfect way to talk about colder and warmer growing regions, but what you hear used most often is this concept of growing degree days. Yep, and if you've been uh, here at Hendry and, and had a tasting, you know, we have our, our map of the vineyard as our placemat, and we have a lot of little facts up at the top corner. And, and on there, we say growing region, and, and we say, you know, three or four. And um, so this refers to, as Mike was saying, these growing degree days, which is just a way of, of sort of measuring um, climate and temperature in a particular uh, area. So uh, the idea is that you take the average temperature for the day, so the highs, you know, high minus low, and you subtract 50 degrees Fahrenheit from this. Um, the idea being that below that, there isn't really much um, happening in terms of berry development out in, in the grape. So, um, you know, anything above that, you then take the sum, you know, every single day between April 1st and October 31st here in the Northern Hemisphere. You add those up and then whatever your total number is, that's going to give you, um, it's going to slot you into one of these five growing regions. So I think it's 1,500 to 5,000 would be sort of the the, the final sum that you get. And the lowest numbers, you know, that puts you in region one. So region one is going to be your, your super cool areas. Region five is going to be the warmest. So um, as Mike said, there are lots of ways to look at climate and there are a lot of data points, but this is a, a pretty common one that people are talking about with grape growing is the degree yeah. days. So um, as we go ahead and, and talk about these different parts of Napa, we're going to be referring to those and yeah. um, what people think about those. So, so you hear re region one to five and the, the way I think about it is region one, it's sort of barely warm enough to, to ripen Vitis vinifera and, you know, re region five, according Salty. to many books you should read <laughs> is for producing raisins, right? And I, I, I'm not sure that's totally true either, but that's, that's the, the language. Um, region four, according to, you know, 
we all in the in the wine world um you know we've, we've come across this book which is sort of an encyclopedia of a variety of things and it it mentions that region four is largely inferior when it comes to um still wines because it's too hot essentially um so here we are you know sort of looking at napa and i, I want to show you one more graph um this is an, another sort of common book in the wine business is the world atlas of wine um and the world atlas of wine has some very interesting things in it Th this is a, a map from 1984 uh, and it basically draws a line right through Oakville and, and says anything south of Oakville is cool uh, and should be Chardonnay, Muscat, Sylvaner, Johannesburg, Riesling, Gewurztraminer, etc. It is, you know, it is important to remember that in 1984, Gewurztraminer was actually worth more than Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, but that, that was the picture in 1984. Yeah. And so, yeah, this is the, the line Mike's talking about right here. Here we've got the town of Yontville. Um, and here they sort of identified these different regions or different grapes for these different regions. So if you get a little further along to the, to the honestly, these, <laughs> I think everybody in Napa has a few wine books. And as I drive around, I see these, you know, estate sales or garage sales and I stop in and I think I have six different editions of the World Atlas <laughs> of Wine and I've bought most of them for 25 cents or so. Um, but this is the 2001 edition uh, and it says that it's in a sudden reversal. It said that Oakville is the center of serious Cabernet country, but Carneros is virtually at the coolest extent of wine growing. That, that's a direct quote. Um, so if we try to put some numbers to these concepts, I, I, I paid $500 for this <laughs> odd and floppy plastic book that We're really- We're committed to the, to the research for this. <laughs> It it's, uh, <laughs> consolidates a bunch of, of weather information, and I, I use the weather information in there to look at Napa through a variety of years um, and see where is it hot and where is it cold. So we have two more graphs to show you. Um, the first of these is Napa in 1997. Um, so there you go. The, the, the dark red is region five. Orange is region four and yellow is region three. Um, so, and then I'm, I'll, we'll contrast this with the next one, um, which is 1998. It, it really shows most of Napa being region three, the warmer parts being region four and, and parts of Carneros being region two. So that, that gives you an idea um, of some of the range. Um, I think one takeaway from that is that it's, it's not this clear straight north to south variation but if, if you look at a number of years of those data what you do see is that in in some of the hottest years parts of Carneros and St. Helena are region five um, and in some of the coolest years parts of Carneros are, are region two um, but I do find it somewhat interesting and amusing to me that if you sort of read between these the lines in these two Jancis Robinson books that she's simultaneously calling Carneros too hot to produce quality wine and virtually at the coolest extent of wine growing. So just another example, and I have lots of respect for Jancis Robinson. I'm not, you know, she, she's- <laughs> Well, I mean, I think par partly what this illustrates is, you know, those are written at different points in time. And as Mike was saying, you know, the, you don't see a lot of Sylvaner in Napa Valley anymore, or Gewurztraminer, right? You know, it's um, perceptions and, and ideas about what works well change, not just based on climate and weather, right? But other factors like, Right. And this, yeah, this is, people like. th yeah. And, and this is not what people like and what's easy to sell. So this is not really part of the topic today, but I, I think one of the issues when, when particularly with wine education, when people talk about what grows where and why the story that is usually told is that we, we grow certain grapes in certain places because they're the best places for those grapes to grow. But the reality of the economics of places like Napa is that there are times when you get paid more to produce terrible Cabernet than great Chardonnay or Pinot Noir, or you get paid more to produce terrible Chardonnay than great Zinfandel or something else. So there are economic factors outside of that that, that work into work into it. And At what least. I, right. right. Um, and, and what I, what I don't, what I'm not trying to say is that climate doesn't matter because it does, but there are 
limitations to, to some of these concepts. We, we, you know, everybody agrees that Carneros is a great place to grow Chardonnay and, and Pinot Noir, but if you really look at the numbers, it's often regions three or four, like much of the rest of Napa Valley. Um, we all, we've all, you know, people who live here, we have that experience of driving south through the valley in the afternoon and hitting a wall of cooler air, but that, that's not necessarily reflective of the way the entire day goes. Um, and there are limitations to the growing degree con day concept that sort of skew the factors somewhat. I, I think most of the places that grow a lot of Vitis vinifera, really the, the average daytime highs in the summer are somewhere between 80 and 85 degrees, um, which is a fairly narrow window, but length of season is one of the most important factors. And when it comes to things like Chardonnay and Cabernet, at least here, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir both have a time between when the flowers bloom and the fruit sets and when we pick them, that's, that's the entire season of grape ripening. That's about 110 days for us. Um, with Cabernet Sauvignon, it's about 135 days from bloom to harvest. So there's a longer harvest. And one of the things that can be misleading about this growing degree day concept, when it, it's, it's adding temperatures from the beginning of April through the end of October, which is closer to 200 days. So if the entire ripening period for Pinot Noir is only 110, then, then some of the stuff on the edges is less meaningful. And, and what you find in some areas, you can actually have much cooler weather in October and April. You can, if you look at Penticton in British Columbia, they, they, there's a lot of wine that's made there and, and a lot of vineyard, but you'll see a lot of freezing low temperatures in April and October. But the high temperatures in July and August are actually a little higher than what we have. So you can have regions with lower growing degree days, but higher midsummer temperatures, which is something that complicates it. And also, if you lived in a place that was 70 degrees every day, all day long, you'd never break a sweat, but you'd be in region five. So um, it's, yeah. it's a little more complicated. Well, and I think as with so many things, timing is really critical too, right? So as Mike's saying, you know, it takes into account these, what we sort of think of as shoulder seasons and, and um, you know, Mike talked about bloom to harvest being a really critical window. And, um, it, you know, if you're sort of unfamiliar with the, the way sort of these grapes develop, we haven't, we haven't seen bloom here yet, right? So bud break happens first and um, that's happening, you know, that happened a little, a little ways, a little time ago in March, um, you know, it's going to be, What's your estimate, Mike, until we start to see bloom in the Chardonnay and Pinot here? Um, it'll be another three weeks. Another three. So yeah. we'll be solidly into May. So, you know, um, not to say that what's happening right now isn't important, but um, when we're thinking about that that ripening window, um, that's when the fruit is set. So that's sort of when the clock starts ticking. So, um, and then you get to the end of the season. And um, when was the last time we had Pinot out in October? Well, we, I don't think we've ever so, had you know, Pinot in October. It, yeah, yeah. It, is, it does sort of... Um, skew things necessarily but it's just um again it's it's one data point that can be interesting and helpful but it's not it doesn't tell the whole story right, right? so the timing is really critical i think as well so I, I think that's kind of a look at some of this topic and and obviously it is a more more complicated one if you have questions we're, we're going to talk about the wines now and, yeah. and you know really what we're doing here but um if you have questions please send them in angela's uh, ready to write them down and that'll <laughs> give us some more uh, some more topics to cover uh, toward the end of this but um, we're gonna move on to our Chardonnay now and and we forgot to say earlier yeah I hope you didn't wait for us to start to start tasting I hope you're uh, drinking something yes, <laughs> as we speak but again one of the benefits of being at home through all this is that uh, you don't need one of these most of the time yeah. you can um, <laughs> taste along with us um, but but this uh, we make two Chardonnays, I think as most, most of you know, and, and I think in the wines that we make, all, all the wines in the Henry label, um, those are the only two that are most importantly separated by wine making. It's not, a, a, um, it's, it's not primarily about something in the vineyard, but what we're tasting today is the barrel fermented version. And, and like it sounds, we, we, we try to make the difference between these two wines plain on the label. and, and um, it's, it's something that most people who like Chardonnay want to talk about, whether or not it's made in a barrel or whether it's a stainless style of wine. Um, so we try to make that obvious. But one of the reasons that I'm, I'm actually very proud of this Chardonnay is that I, 
I don't think that there's much Chardonnay like this left in Napa anymore. It's actually, um, it's one of the oldest Chardonnay vineyards in Napa. The one, the one we're using for this now was planted in 1974. Um, I spent a bunch of time trying to find older vineyards in Napa with Chardonnay and only came up with two. Um, there's one that was planted in 1968 and one in the early 70s. Um, and then our, our neighbors nearby in Carneros, the true shards, have some from 74 also. Um, but one of the problems with Chardonnay now, and an average ton of Chardonnay is worth a little less than $3,000. Um, and average farming costs here are almost $10,000 an acre. You can, you can spend a lot more, um, and people do. But uh, th this stuff typically produces about two tons per acre of Chardonnay, actually a little under uh, is the average over the last 20 years or so. And um, if you look at two tons of Chardonnay at $3,000 a ton and $10,000 an acre in farming costs, you can start to understand very quickly why there isn't a lot of this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and that, and those yields are because of the age of the vines? It's, it's a combination of things. In this case, it, it's a very austere vineyard site. Um, it is a, a site that would be a very good Cabernet vineyard. It's also related to this particular clone of, of Chardonnay, and I'm, I'm abusing the term clone slightly, but um, there weren't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of Chardonnay in California at all in, in 1960. There were about 500 acres or something. There were only two commercially viable Chardonnay vineyards that survived prohibition, and one of these, the Wente Vineyard, became the source of, of many of the Chardonnay clones that we have now. So many of the established clones are selections from the Wente Vineyard. This is, is what we call an old Wente selection. So it's not technically a clone, but it's cuttings that came from um, the Wente Vineyard at, at some point. And th those clusters are, are, they tend to be fairly small clusters and they have a lot of very small berries within them or a, a mix of berry sizes. Um, you know, hens and chicks, you, you may have heard that expression. That's, that's what they look like. So it's, it's partly site, it's partly clonal, and it's, it's also partly the way that we farm. We don't, we have um, very little water to use. Um, we, we could have higher crop levels with more water use, but that, that's not the way we do it. Um, in terms of the way this wine is made, um, it, it's obviously fermented in the barrels, but I think it's the barrel aging that's the more important part of that and the lees contact. And you want to talk about what leaves are in case folks are... Go ahead. Yeah, so, sure. Yeah. Maybe we can explain that. Yeah. yeah. So when you've got the end of this fermentation process, you've got all these, you know, yeast cells that have, you know, expired and they're at the bottom of the barrel. And, um, you know, if you want to give them... The idea is if you're sort of uh, either stirring them up or letting the wine sit on that, that's going to add... Um, some like, you know, yeasty kind of character. Well, that sounds obvious, but like some, you know, um, it has a creamy character in my mind. Yeah. yeah. Um, sort of a nice textural component to the wine. Um, so if you have had the opportunity to have our two Chardonnays, you know, um, I think the, the first thing people often point out is, um, between the two is that the unoaked feels a lot, uh, crisper. People say a lot of the time, a, little, a lot more acidic, and this has definitely a creaminess to it. And, and, um, you know, we, we attribute that to that least contact. Yeah, and I, I think that the the winemaking objective with the unoaked Chardonnay is really to express the fresh fruit in the grape, and we do that by limiting oxygen exposure and not, you know, introducing any of the the oak flavors or the or the things that go with the least contact. So it's it's sort of yeah. trying to, to stabilize and bottle that wine essentially as quickly as possible. Um, and then this, I mean, that the aging of wine. You know, it's, it's so much of this is about the, the slow controlled exposure of the wine to oxygen and barrels are a big part of that. So it's that um, barrel aging that often starts to moderate some of those very fresh fruit characteristics and, and you start to get some, um, I mean, there's a very nice sort of melon kind of fruit to that. There's some uh, sort of honey notes some nuttiness that comes from that time and oxygen exposure. Yeah. And one of the things I love about this wine the most and, um, you know, if, if, I, you know, up until maybe a couple of years ago, if I, you know, was in a store picking, you know, California Chardonnays, I'd be looking for that unoaked on the label, my own pers you know, personal, personal preferences. You know, as Mike says, we try and be very clear on the label, you know, how and distinguish our unoaked version from the barrel fermented. And, um, you know, I think Chardonnay uh, in California, as Mike said, it's been here in Napa for a really long time. And I think we've seen lots of sort of trends come and go in terms of how people are working with it. And the 
barrel aging and you starting to see stainless steel aging and all of that. Um, this is one of my favorite wines, I think, that, that we make here um, because, you know, it does have, you know, that touch of oak and all of you Hendry fans will know that we state really clearly, you can't really see this from there, I, I recognize, but, you know, we tell you the blocks. In this case, we actually tell you the yields, you know, as, as Mike was talking about, but then we describe, you know, the kind of oak we're using, how much of it is new, how much of it, um, has been used before and I think um, it does have that sort of creamy consistency and, and some of those richer uh, notes that I wouldn't describe as fresh fruit necessarily, but you know, a little more baked apple and that kind of thing. But it maintains, I think, a real, um, I think it has some real nice lightness to it. You know, it does, I think the acid is still really nice and present in there. And to me, that makes it really, really enjoyable. So um, I've had to, you know, uh, change my tune a little bit. And I, I think this is, this is, as I said, for me, one of my real favorites right now. Yeah. And I, I mean, it's, I want to, I want to add something about the back. You'll see that it, it lists actually all of our Chardonnay blocks on the back for this vintage and for, uh, a couple, at least on either side, this wine is exclusively been from our, our older vines and block nine, which are that, uh, old Muente selection that I mentioned. Um, we like to, keep some flexibility in what is going to happen from year to year. And, and that's the reason we list them all on the back. And in case there are years, you know, this year we have substantial frost damage. So, you know, where we get our Chardonnay and how much we'll get um, remains to be seen. Um, and that may require a little more blending. So we, 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 we can, it's kind of a fudge on the back with what we do, but I, I can tell you for the last several years, it's, it's been uh, exclusively block nine. Yeah. It's a good one, I think Great. a good versatile one um, for lots of different meals too. So I'd be curious to know what people are, are pairing with this tonight. So, should we talk about Pinot? Yeah, and, and so Pinot is something that we, we've been growing here since 1973 when uh, George really started replanting uh, the vineyard here. And, and it was, the, you know, the, the advice of the day was this end of the valley's too cool for Cabernet. Um, you know, Zinfandel was something he knew that worked, so we planted a lot of Zinfandel. And then we have, there. there's sort of a couple of levels to our vineyard. Um, it's re really, we are in the southern, and you know, I suppose I should have mentioned this while we were showing the maps, but our vineyard lies really right on the, on the western boundary, the northwestern boundary of the city of Napa. So we're in the, the foothills of the Mayakama, the, the end of the Mayakamas range is Mount Veter, and we're on the, the foothills of Mount Veter on the west side of the valley. Um, and the vineyard goes between about 150 and 300 feet in ele elevation. And most of it is a, a fairly coarse when the, the creek that flows through our property sort of broke through the neighboring ridge, it pushed a, a very broad fan of, of rock and gravel and, and bigger boulders out into this bench. And, and as it's cut down through that over time, we have a, a number of younger stream terraces that, that run along the creek and they're they tend to be a more sandy, gravelly kind of soil, and it's a little deeper than the stuff up above. It's a little less, um, a little less stressful as far as fine growth goes. There's a little more moisture content, a little more canopy development. Um, those blocks also being close to the base of, of the steep ridge to the west of us also get a little more shade in the afternoon, which in terms of, you know, we, we we've talked about climate in the broader sense, but, you know, things like microclimate matters, and, and one of the important things with microclimate is that you can, you know, from one side of the hill to the other, that the west facing side of the slope and the east facing side of the slope um, really have very different growing conditions. We, you know, we, <laughs> I was yeah. mentioning, we, we built a reservoir two years ago and spread the same wildflower mix all around the, the sides of the reservoir. And now on the south and west facing slopes, we have completely different plants than on the north and east facing slopes. And Grapevines feel that too. Yeah, well, and I think that just sort of underlines the, I think the point, you know, we were trying to make about climate is that it is part of a larger story, right? You know, and so climate, you know, you've got weather changes year to year, but climate sort of is supposed to tell you sort of generally and in, in, you know, most years what this place, what a given place is like. And you could argue that we, you know, our whole vineyard um, shares a climate, but as Mike's you know, laying out here, we've got aspect issues depending on, you know, um, which way these vines are planted and, and the exposure they're getting to sun. You've got these soil influences um, that you've laid out. So it's, it's just part and parcel of, you know, all the decisions that go into figuring out what you're going to plant where and then how you're going to farm it. Right. right. And, and even though in the broadest sense that the climate within our vineyard is the same, 
there's a reason that we have it divided into almost 50 smaller blocks as well. And that, you know, it, it's saying that the climate overall is the same is not the same as saying that every one of the grapes we grow here would do well everywhere. So um, there are, you know, places that would sort of be disastrous for Pinot Noir and, and there are places that would be disastrous for Cabernet Sauvignon and we, we, we have that range. Um, but the Pinot is, is, is these, these gravelly stream terraces along the, along the creek. Um, and that's where we've been growing Pinot for a long time. So we, we've experimented with a, a variety of, of Pinot Noir clones in this particular wine. Um, it's some of the first uh, crops from our, our most recent replantings of blocks four and five, uh, and then a couple of, of older blocks. I think very importantly, our, our Pinot Noir is, um, it's the only wine that we make, and I, I've never heard George ever use this phrase, but, and he might cringe at it, but it's, it's the only one <laughs> well, where we would call it a natural <laughs> fermentation, right? So we were not actually, it's the only fermentation in our grapes where you don't actually add a population of yeast to it. Um, it ferments very quickly on its own. Um, and I think this is also one of the reasons, I mean, it is, I think the Pinot Noir varies more year to year than some of the other wines we make and the, the variability in, in the yeast and the, how the fermentation progresses uh, is part of that. I, I think this one, I like it a lot. I, it, it's a very sort of tart, um, kind of a crisp, we were sort of debating, you know, cranberry yeah. rhubarb. It has this sort of vote in the, in the chat. Who thinks cranberry, who thinks rhubarb? And yeah. <laughs> we'll I, see if we can finalize this. <laughs> so I, 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 I like this one quite a bit. It, it has a nice balance for me. There's some nice firm tannins. There are a few, um, you know, I was getting some sort of coffee notes that may be also related to sort of barrel char and that sort of thing. Um, there were some, some, uh, some, hint of something minty to me, um, but it's, uh, I think it's going to be a good one. Yeah, and, and actually the last couple, um, the last two uh, virtual tastings we've done, we've talked a little bit about age, um, and I think, you know, we often think of wines like Cabernet Sauvignon or, you know, Zinfandel last week, we talked about this, um, that maybe have a more robust tannin structure as, as more age-worthy, but um, let's talk about age with these a little bit, you know, like, could you put this down for a, a while? Um, I mean, last summer we opened up, I think, one of George's 08 Pinots, and yeah. it was pretty tasty. So I don't think that that's something, um, you know, you and, necessarily shy away from. And, and the Chardonnay as well. I mean, yeah. honestly, some of my favorite experiences with our wines in the last several years have been with Chardonnays that are, you know, 7 to 12 or 15 years old. And, and they, you know, yeah. it, you're, it's, there's always the cork lottery, I call it. Um, but you know they, they can also age beautifully yeah, um, yeah so. and they, they're going to change a little bit you know some of that fresh fruit that we're talking about now like all that tartness you know that's maybe going to um start to mellow out a little bit and you're going to get other notes in there but um yeah you certainly could put these down for a while if, if you like you know this is a 17 pinot so we released this gosh and when was it I, like a couple months ago right mm -hmm. so it's still fairly young and i think you know it'd be fun to sort of see how it changes yeah um well, Angela has shared a couple questions with us, so I say we, we jump in. Um, this, I think, is a really fun question, and I'm not sure who sent it in. Um, the question is, what attribute, attributes does climate bring to the vintage? So, um, you know, warm, warm years, uh, cold years. I think maybe climate isn't so much the word, but, but weather, you know, or the yeah. temperatures. What, how, what kind of impact does that have on the fruit? So that's not a short answer question yeah. <laughs> for sure. So you, you and a, a few of, I mean, some of the things that have a huge effect on the vintage ultimately for us are sort of heat through the harvest season. And, and 2015 and 17, although this Pinot and Chardonnay were both picked before this, but sort of the hottest temperatures ever recorded in in this area some of them were in the fall of 2017 right in the middle of harvest so this can have huge effects on you know the fruit and how you're picking it and how it's able to ripen and so you know heat, heat waves is one thing obviously rain and water is another this year um we're on we have a little over 15 inches of rain which is is close to half of our typical rainfall Last year we had almost twice our typical rainfall. So there are um, some grapes that are, are 
very expressive of changes in vine vigor. Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc are obvious ones. Um, and not only did it rain a lot last year, but a lot of that rain came later in the spring and even into May. Um, so additional inches of rain in May translate into additional months of vine growth for us, um, which can have huge effects on things too. Also, heat stress and water availability relatively early in the growing season um, can have a lot to do with phenolic development. So there are, are times, you know, heat waves even before verasion um, can have big effects on phenolic development in grapes, tannins, uh, tannic structure, bitterness, that, that kind of thing. So th there are a lot of potential sources of, of climatic variation that just go beyond average temperature. Sure. Right. Yeah. And I think as, as you're saying, timing does have a big part of it, right? right. You know, if, we, if you look at years where we had, you know, a ton of rain and say the next year it was very little rain, you know, if, if the, you know, all the rain came in December, say, uh, it doesn't have quite as much of the same impact as if, you know, it came later in the season, right? Right. In fact, so, I mean, when the vines are dormant, to a point, it doesn't really matter how much it rains, right? We, we, the soils here, <coughs> excuse me, they hold about six inches of usable water. Um, and what we would like is for the soil to be essentially saturated at this time of the year when you're going through bud break. And then that the vines have that sort of reservoir of water to deplete through the summer. Um, and we have, you know, a few drops to give them later, but, but that's about it. So there are times when you know you if you if all your rain comes in November and December, but then January and February are dry. Even though you had a decent amount of rain, you can have very dry growing conditions for the plants. And there are years where you know if all if you don't get a lot of rain, but it comes late, as far as the vines can tell, they you know Same it's a, as, so yeah, it could be totally timing fine. of the rain yeah. is very important. Um, and there are times where it, it's especially important, right? So bloom, if we're heading into bloom in a couple of weeks here, right? That is a really sort of water and nutrients are, are pretty critical at that point. Am I right? And, right, yeah. And so if, if we were worried about water, would you ever consider, I mean, is that a, a, a moment where you might want to spend a little water if you had it? And, you know, it would maybe then have implications for what we can do later in the season? Um, it would be sort of hard to imagine using water at this time okay. of year, um, especially when really most of the water we have ends up getting used for the development of young vines. So we, we can't, um, we, we just don't have enough to do that. Yeah. So we're, we're not, I mean, we're not dry farm, but it's important to remember that if you combine kind of the main growing season months of June, July, August, September, on average, we get about three eighths of an inch or a, a centimeter of rain in those four months. It really doesn't rain much here. Our entire <coughs> irrigation reservoirs give us um, the total of about you know two inches of water that we can put on this. So it's not it's not much. Yeah. Um, so Blake Garcia, hi Blake, says uh, or asks how uh, how has climate change affected the growth of the grapes? So I, I think one of the biggest things my my I have my grape phenology spreadsheet and I, you know, that the- And grape phenology is? The timing of various events in vine growth. Key milestones like in the grape's life. Right. right. And the, the ones that we look at are bud breaks. So when the buds, when the leaves first appear, uh, bloom, when the, when the flowers bloom. And fruit is set on the vine. Right. Um, verasion. Verasion, right. So when the grapes change color and then harvest is, is the obvious one. So, um, all of these grape varieties, you, you heard me mention bloom to harvest or bloom to harvest times for, for Pinot and, and Cabernet. Almost no matter when these vines bloom, they're, they're, they're on a very predictable sort of schedule after that. And it, it varies a little, but really not that much. So when you have an early spring, you're going to have an early harvest. And, and that's really sort of unavoidable. And in my spreadsheet, I just what I have on my computer, it starts at 1998. Um, and a few years ago, I, I came up with this statistic. If, if you go from 1998 to 2012, which is 15 harvests inclusive, um, harvest took an average of 40 days, uh, and we finished harvest in September only twice. Uh, and then between 2013 and 2017, which is five harvests, we finished harvest in September four out of five years, and harvest took an average of 31 days. Um, the last two years, 2018 and 19, were, were pr 
probably much more like historical average, but this year, um, we've again, we're, we're within a, a day or two of our earliest bud break ever. So um, it's very, it's, it's early again, um, and it's gonna be an early harvest. And what happens to us with the earlier harvest is that the bulk of harvest gets pushed into what are some of the hottest days of the year, which is one of the, the really significant points there. Um, in the later harvest, you know, much of the Cabernet and the later ripening fruit is getting pushed into the cooler days of mid-October, um, and not the sort of the hot, hotter days in mid-September. Um, another, uh, you know, we've gotten a couple of questions uh, over the last couple of weeks, actually, about the fires in 2017, you know, which some people would say these extreme weather events, you know, are, are related to climate change, not just the, the increase in temperature. Um, how did that affect us here a couple of years ago? Um, I'm, I actually, I, I thought of one more point I wanted yeah. to make with the weather, and then I'm going to go back to the fires. But, the, you know, I, I showed you those two World Atlas of Wines, the one in 19... 84 where right. I basically said, you know, if you're in Oakville, you're pushing it for ripening, ripening anything but worse demeanor. And then by 2001, it said, you know, Oakville is great for Cabernet. And, and, you know, some of you might be wondering, well, is that climate change? And I think the answer to that is no. I mean, climate is, you know, things are warming up, but that scale of increase is actually quite slow. And according to NOAA, which is probably as good a source as any, um, the average rate of, of warming within Cal California is about 0.1 degrees Fahrenheit per decade. Um, so that, that's a lot uh, in, in the, the broad sense of climate, but it's not that much in terms of the way grapes ripen. But I think what's been happening with the fires we've had, and they've been, um, you know, there's, it's, they've been big ones. Um, what's ha we haven't been getting sort of the earlier rain in October. Um, and, and often we'll, we'll really start to get some rain into October and then a, a decent amount of rain in mid-October and things start to green up. But the last few years, uh, we haven't gotten that fall rain. And then when, when we, uh, some of the hottest weather and some of the coldest weather are, are when we have a high pressure system to the north and, and we get a very strong north wind. Um, so we get, it really hasn't rained for six months and it blows 60 miles an hour and yeah. they're, you know, power lines and sparks and fires and dogs and campers and whatever and and when a when a fire starts in those conditions it 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 goes so i mean i, I don't know i don't even know how much of those fires to attribute to real climate change but i can say that they've been unusually dry falls that's really set up the conditions for these yeah. things and we we were very lucky with um all of that you know many, many of our neighbors were were less lucky um, but in both cases um all of our fruit was was in and picked at that time and and we um you know power here we're, we're not far out of town but power's been unreliable but george been um day. yeah <laughs> you know george went a few years ago george bought a giant generator and we all sort of thought that was typical george overkill and then you know two weeks later when the power went out and all our fermenters were full um we all did a 180 degree turnaround and congratulated George on his force. <laughs> yeah, so right, yeah. you know, that we, we were very lucky. Um, but the fires were, were, you know, a big deal for a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think one question that people sometimes ask, you know, we hear this in the tasting room is about smoke tea, right? That's become an issue. And, and to be honest, I, I don't really <laughs> know much about that, but I do think that it is becoming an, uh, increasingly an area that people are starting to study and try and understand a little bit. Um, because yeah. we have had some pretty extreme fires in California the last couple of years, and but as Mike said, we didn't really have to deal yeah. with that thing. Smoke, that smoke, like. smoke damage on grapes. It, it's a big and it's a, a contentious topic. You, you can imagine that. And, and what's happened, it, there are combinations of things that have produced these problems, but grape skins in any format are sort of sponges for aromatic compounds and they soak up smoke and people are, trying to find a way to, you know, in terms of chemistry to come up with a number that sort of determines what is acceptable or unacceptable levels of smoke taint. But one of the things that happened in 2018, it was one of California's biggest harvests. Um, and I really think there were a lot of wineries that were looking for any excuse they could find to back out of existing contracts that they had. Um, and they were, you know, did their best to walk away from whatever fruit was still out there 
when they could. And, and obviously there were a lot of growers that were very upset about that, that felt like their fruit was not smoke damaged. So, you know, trying, trying to find, trying to, I mean, I'm, I'm glad I'm not in the middle of that and haven't been in the middle of it, but it's a big issue for a bunch of people and they're trying to come up with a way to standardize levels of smoke damage. Right. Yeah. I think it's a, a growing area of, of study. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So relatedly, uh, someone asked if there was any impact from the 2017 fires on the Pinot that we're drinking now, since this is a 2017. Um, no, no is the answer. So yeah. all, all of our fruit was, was in and picked at that time and smoke damage comes from, you know, it, it comes from smoke contact with the grape skin. So it doesn't, there's no sort of carryover effect to the following year. It doesn't affect the, the, the vines, but all of our fruit from the, from the early stuff through the Cabernet was in before those fires started. Um, a couple people going back to the wines had asked, um, so this is Nancy, why are the Pinot and the Chardonnay paired together in this tasting? Well, they, they, I mean, they're, they're paired together because they're, we, we've lumped them into the category of cool climate grapes and, and they obviously, they have a similar, time for bud break and and a similar ripening season and we we pick them at nearly the same time they also are, are really the the two predominant grapes in burgundy which is you know they're they sort of you know pinot and chardonnay grow side right. by side it, in a lot of places yeah um they are definitely considered by many to be sort of birds of a feather and that's you know why we, we titled this climate and burgundian grapes um the assumption uh, sort of embedded in that was that you know people now that they've started to think of Napa as a Cabernet destination um, sort of you know, start to, to wonder you know how we how we grow these grapes so um, we thought it was a helpful pairing in order to be able to explore this topic um, we also just really like both of these wines so that, <laughs> that's part of it too is that we, helps. Want to, we want to drink things that we really uh, enjoy um, going back to the fires this is hi Rick this is from Rick Drum um, do fires have any longer lasting effect on the soil um, at, at the level we experience them, no. I, I think, um, you know, in a place where it did actually burn, so, you know, on forest soils, certainly, and vineyard soils, no. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Donna, I see you asked about Carneros Pinot versus Oregon Pinot. Um, you know, and that's something I feel like it's sort of hard for us to comment on. Um, you know, we are not making wine in either of those places. Um, I, was, I well, would say we looked a little bit at temperatures in those places as a point of reference for this. Yeah, so right. so it's, I mean, all, all I did, I mean, if you, you know, comparing all these Pinots, that, that's a big topic and, and takes a lot of work. But if you want to compare climate, you can really do it in the same ways that I did and, and just look at, I mean, look at average highs and lows in McMinnville in, in Oregon and compare that to, to Napa. And, and see what you find. And, um, you know, it, it, you can find exceptions, but it, it may not be climate wise, it may not be as different as you think. But just, I mean, look up the numbers and, and see what you find. You can, it, it's a rabbit hole that you can, you know, once you start asking these questions, <laughs> right. you can ask them of a lot of places. But there are interesting comparisons to be made yeah. in, in a lot of these areas. And I think it's, um you know, it's it's not just those numbers though, right? As we've been saying, there are lots of other factors, you know, and I think, you know, folks in the Russian River Valley like to talk about sort of this, you know, straight line over to the coast and the cool air and, you know, they're gonna, you know, highlight other sort of interesting geographic features up in up in um, the Willamette Valley. And so that, I think all of that comes into account as well. Yeah. Um, so. so everybody, all of us and everybody in every wine region is guilty of, you know, talking about the <laughs> right. things that make their region special. And uh, in, in the bigger picture, like really if you take a step back and look at where Vitis vinifera grows, there are a lot of climate similarities in all those places. We all inherently want to talk about why we're different, but I mean, if, you, if what you're looking for is the similarities, there's a lot to find there too. Yeah. Um, someone had asked, uh, we had mentioned briefly that we've seen some frost damage this year. Yeah. So, um, are there because of the the timing of these these particular two uh, grapes? Is that something we see more in Chardonnay and Pinot? And what are the effects of that for the rest of the season? Um, well, it, the effects can be big. We we actually frost damage. One of the problems with frost when these grapevines start to grow, um, 
and for the first at least six weeks or two months, the the, sh the shoots aren't woody. They're they're more like a piece of lettuce than a stick. And and when they freeze, they wilt. And and even when the shoots are an inch long, you've already got the primordial flower clusters showing. So if they freeze, you lose the clusters. And the vines, they really recover and continue to grow. But in years where you have more frost damage, you tend to lose fruit. And then the fruit you get for a variety of reasons is, is ripens more unevenly. Um, so I'm not sure how much fruit we've lost yet. It's a little bit hard to tell, um, but certainly within Chardonnay, Pinot, even um, Albarino, we, we have a bunch of frost damage oh, yeah. this year. And hmm. when you get, Chardonnay and Pinot are more susceptible to it because they start to grow earlier. Um, so if you, you know, and we, we've talked about warm climate and cool climate, and I've also sort of alluded to the importance of longer season and shorter season. If, if you're in a place where you don't have a very long growing season, you, you kind of need to get started when it first warms up and you need to kind of go as long as you can and pick it then. And, and that's why Chardonnay and Pinot grow in places where you have shorter growing seasons. But when they start to grow early, that also makes them more susceptible to frost. And historically, we've always had to deal with some frost. We don't have um, we don't have any frost protection within the vineyard. We're a, you know a couple hundred feet off the valley, valley floor, and there's a little slope to the land, and the cold air generally flows off well enough. We haven't. 2008 um, is the only year where we really had a lot of frost damage that I can think of. There, I think. George talks about some year in the 70s that I don't remember, but um, this year is the first year in at least seven years where we've had substantial frost damage at all. I, I would even say in the last, I actually bought a like a little wind machine to work on a couple problem frost spots seven years ago, and then I didn't turn it on for six years. We really didn't have a day of frost for about six years. Um, so this, again, we I mean, we were, I had, I, I sort of scored 50% bud break in the Chardonnay around March 5th, which is probably, you know, two weeks earlier than average. And, uh, you know, sure enough, we, we paid for it. Yeah. Do we have any other questions, Angela? Do, oh, we've got, a, uh, all right. So people weighed in on rhubarb versus cranberry. <laughs> and I hate to say that Mike Hendry wins this one. Uh, I voted for cranberry. He voted for rhubarb. And it looks like many of you voted for rhubarb as well. So. Yeah. We'll have to add that to the uh, to the tasting notes. Um, people also chimed in, uh, and this is going to make me really hungry with some food pairing ideas for these wines. Um, white pizza, that sounds delicious. Uh, if you're in Napa, uh, I was thinking of picking up a Trevina pizza tonight on the way home, and they have a really good white and mushroom pizza that I think with either of these would be really delicious. Um, baked brie and croquettas. Also oh, sounds yeah. really good. Lamb chops and pinot. I think lambs come up in all three of our tastings the last yeah. couple of weeks. So um, good thing we know a guy. Um, so <laughs> my father-in-law is raising lamb. So if you want to buy one, let us know. Like, uh, I can hook you up. <laughs> yeah. Um, shrimp scampi, also delicious. Um, oh yeah. Wild goose breast. Bruce yeah. LaBelle, we're going to have to come to your nice. place when this is over and get a sampling of that. Um, that's a uh, that's some ambitious quarantine cooking, I think, mm -hmm. right here. Um, but it all sounds really good. Um, looks like we've got another question here, um, and then we'll, we'll sort of wrap these things up here. Um, how well do these two wines age? When should we drink them? So we did say you could put them down if you wanted to. Um, you could put a little age on them. Um, in terms of prime drinking years? Well, I mean, again, it, it depends what you like. I think these wines both um, are plenty ready to drink now, but for a number of years will continue to be interesting and, and evolve. Um, so, you know, if, if you like these, you know, buy a few and stretch it out over, you know, open one every six months and see what you think, but they'll, yeah. Yeah, don't, don't be in a hurry necessarily. Um, they can age well for quite a while. Yeah. I mean, I, I like older wines. I mean, I, I like to, I like to, you know, one of the, the our wine library here is one of, the great perks in my life is I get to, you know, sort of explore that and, and look at the wines as they age. But, um, you know, some of them are disappointing and some of them are amazing. And, you know, you, it's, it's not always obvious at the start, but I, I think both of these will age very well. 
Yeah. Yeah. I personally like Pinots in particular with a little bit of age on them. So I wouldn't be afraid to wait a couple more years to drink that. But again, if you like that really bright, bright fresh rhubarb fruit, then <laughs> dive into it now, I would say. Um, so I see in the chat, you know, there were some questions, you know, when we started talking about the barrel fermented versus an oak Chardonnay, um, you know, we are starting to brainstorm a little bit, you know, what other topics we might want to um, discuss on these tastings. Uh, you know, next week we're going to be looking at two cabs, the 05 cab and the 15 cab, which will be a fun comparison. Uh, and then the week after that uh, will be Friday, May 1st. So we thought, let's look at light, light whites. So we're going to do the Unoaked Chardonnay and the Albarino. So if you love the Unoaked, um, tune in then. Um, but let us know if you'd be interested in maybe a, a Chardonnay comparison. We could talk a little bit about barrels in that, you know, um, potentially. So um, do send us any suggestions you have or, or other questions for broader topics that you want to explore. Um, also, a, a quick housekeeping note, uh, there was some confusion. Due to the whims of technology, we do have a new <laughs> registration link for every single webinar every week. So um, you know, it's a bit of a pain, but it's a fairly seamless registration process. So if you are interested in either the cab or the springtime wines, um, if you head to our website, hendrywines.com, um, you scroll to the bottom, there's a list of events and you can find all of the information about those, including the link to register. So um, please do sign up. We would love to see you guys. This has been a really fun thing for us, I think, to look forward to every week. So that will sign Thanks, up. everybody. Yeah, yeah. thanks for, for joining us. And, uh, you know, we'll all get through this together and be able to sit down here again face to face soon. But in the meantime, you know, cheers and we would <laughs> have a great take, weekend. Yeah, take care. <laughs> Bye.